Okay, before we get going here on 32 Thoughts, the podcast, a quick programming note. Uh, this will be the last podcast until next Friday, which just means we're taking one podcast off. We hope you're enjoying the holiday season with your family and friends. We hope to do the same here. I know we're lazy, we're slackers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This podcast returns next Friday. Enjoy the best of the holiday season, everybody. Welcome once again to 32 Thoughts, the podcast presented as always by the GMC Sierra. And Elliot, I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem like anybody in the NHL, except for you, interestingly enough, who wore lovely Christmas green on the uh, television tonight on the magic eyeball. Loved seeing that. Mm -hmm. uh, no one is really in a good mood. No one really seems happy. Oh, no. Everybody seems edgy. Everybody seems angry. Everybody seems cranky. Uh, we got a lot to choose from, uh, from Thursday the night. The taunting was off the charts on Thursday okay. night too. What, what was the bigger taunt? Uh, Washington towards Elvis Mers Lickens or the Buffalo Sabres playing You Make My Dreams Come True by Hall & Oates as they're smashing the Toronto Maple Leafs? I was going to say so. the social media one was the bigger taunt simply because the music was played in the building and it's subtle, right? They're playing oh, the Leafs. That is not. You, no, no, you no, think no, no, that's no. subtle? <laughs> yes. I'll tell you. Uh, compared to what the Capitals did, it's subtle. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe you would think that was subtle. Well, compared to what the Capitals did, it absolutely was subtle because it's just in the building uh -huh. and people have to notice it, right? Uh huh. Uh, it, it, they're not. It's not like they're putting it on a social media page. Uh -huh. The Capitals <laughs> picked the most egregious <laughs> photo of them all staring at Merzlikens and threw it onto the internet. That's a sledgehammer. That's not subtle. The song with 65 seconds left in the blowout game, and it's the song that the Leafs fans hate yes. and want to get rid of. Yes. That is more subtle. All I could think about as I'm watching that, because the Leafs are getting demolished. 9-3 is the final score. And at the key bank, they start playing that song. All I could think about is this would make a great playoff series. If just the Buffalo Sabres could get there, if just the Buffalo Sabres could get their act together to get there, Toronto and Buffalo with these two rosters could be a glorious seven-game series, Elliot. Yes, it's been too long. Oh. Last time they played in the playoff series was 1999 on the Sabres' route to the Stanley Cup final. And that series was over too quick. It just didn't last. It was five games. Yep, Maple Leafs got goalied in that one very much. Um, and then Buffalo got foot in the crease uh, in the subsequent series against the Dallas Stars. Uh, let's start with that Buffalo-Toronto game. This is the game that you worked with uh, Justin, Nick, and David. Um, one of the, There's a lot of stories coming out of this one. The nine spot put up by Buffalo after surrendering nine uh, to Columbus earlier this week. But Samsonov getting pulled. I guess is one of the more dominant stories coming out of this one to say nothing of a, and we should congratulate Buffalo on a really good bounce back game, but Samson off. Let's start there and see where we end up. So nine, three loss. Samson off gives up an ugly goal, goal early, a bad one. He makes a great save on a shorthanded chance. It looks like he's rebounding. And then, you know, Jeff, what really happened was he was swimming. You know, he was sliding. He was losing his net. Um, you could really see that it was going to be a rough night for him. He just didn't have it. And you'll remember a week ago, they're down 5 nothing after 2 to Columbus. And I thought for sure he's coming out of the game. And the goalie coach, Curtis Sanford, we find out later, says, no, um, you know, we're going to, we want Ilya to battle with the rest of the team. And they eventually got that game to overtime where they lost. So I just assumed the same thing was going to happen. It was 3-2 after one. He didn't have a good period, but I wasn't surprised in the least bit. He came out for the second. And then all of a sudden, it's 5-3. to three. The fifth one had a real odor to it, and, and he was gone. And, you know, Jeff, it's Christmas. I wore the Christmas sweater. I don't celebrate Christmas, but I'm a festive guy. Like, it's it's a nice time of year. I, I want people to be happy. I want people to, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of snow. It's not going to be a white Christmas, mm. but I still want people to have a good festive holiday season. No matter what you celebrate, Christmas, Hanukkah, Festivus, whatever your choice is. And 
he looked miserable. And, you know, that's the one thing about Samsonov that I was told when they, when he, they signed him and he came over after Washington didn't qualify him. The thing I was told about Samsonov was it's a roller coaster emotionally. He goes up, he goes down. You know, one of the things the Capitals really tried to work with him on was evening out the peaks and valleys. There's, there's good days, there's bad days. And when you're a goaltender in particular, you wear those days more than a lot of other players. Your mistakes are much more open than a lot of other players. Um, but, you know, the Capitals just weren't successful in doing that. They couldn't uh, mediate them like they wanted to. And we saw the hard end for Samsonov here. He looked devastated in that hallway. And, you know, obviously Joseph Wall is out right now. Nick thinks it's not going to be till February that, till he comes back. and. So it's Samsonov, it's Martin Jones, and they have a young kid who's playing really well in the American Hockey League, Dennis Hildeby, but he's in his first year overseas, right? So, you know, like the, the kids played, what, 15 games? You're going to throw them into the NHL after that? I mean, to me, it's crazy. Unless you're going out and you're trading for another goalie, you just have to work with Samsonov until Wool gets healthy. Like one of the arguments was throw him down to the minors right now. Well, number one, he can't because we're in the holiday freeze. And number two, um, I just, until Wool's ready, I, I don't see how that even makes sense. So you probably have to ride Jones a little bit here and you have to get like the one, Jock Martin's back coaching now. And I remember him telling me uh, one story about Patrick Waugh. And he said the thing that made Patrick Waugh as great as he was was if he had a bad game, he was on the ice the next morning, no pucks, no pucks. He was out there, and he was just going through his movements, his motions. And I've always remembered that. Corey Crawford, when he had that awful game against Boston in the 2013 Stanley Cup Final, they fly overnight from uh, Chicago to Boston. The next morning, he's out by himself uh, before practice, just I saw him. He was on the ice, just working on his movements, and that's all you can do. You unless you're trading for someone else, and don't forget the Maple Leafs don't have a lot of assets here. They're and they're basically sitting there saying, "How are we going to spend the assets to get what we need this year?" You just have to work with this guy and get him through it. That's all you can do. But man, that was tough to watch, and it's been a nightmare season for Samsonov. He just doesn't look good at all. And, he, you know, Jeff, there are some guys that can bet on themselves and there's some guys that can't handle the uncertainty. And he's got uncertainty after this year and he just looks like a guy right now who's having trouble handling the uncertainty. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, and they it, were terrible in front of them. They, they were bad. They didn't help him out. And listen, I don't think the Maple Leafs helped out Martin Jones uh, at all either. Like that was a team that quit. Uh, by the end, everybody was doing elevator practice as the Buffalo Sabres danced all around them. Um, but speaking of netminders, what about the guy at the other end uh, of the rink? And that's Devin Levi, who, listen, we talk about bounce backs. That was a big bounce back for Levi. Yeah, and to be honest, I didn't think Buffalo was that great uh, in the first period. And But they stabilized themselves, I thought. And then in the second, I was kind of talking about how it was still winnable. I I have not had a great year for predictions, I have to say. Hmm. This might be my worst year of predictions in my professional career, which is really saying something. Because when it got to 8-3, people were tweeting at me like, do you still think this is a winnable game? It was pretty (laughs) funny. I have to to hand it to those people. You know, Levi, um, it's interesting there. So I wrote something in my notes on Thursday Um, where I talked about how the Sabres made him promises. And I do think there is a debate in the Sabres organization about what's the right way to do this. And obviously right now he's in the NHL. He went to the minors, the American League, for a weekend, but then they had an injury and needed him back up. I do think there are people in that organization who feel that he should spend more time in the American Hockey League. He's a really talented guy and he's going to be a great goalie. But they just think this is too much too soon, I've heard. So, um, you know, I I wrote on Thursday that, you know, there were some promises made to Levi. And one person reached out to me and they said, look, they they weren't crazy about the way that read because it made it sound like the Sabres have promised Levi that he's guaranteed to be in the NHL. 
And that's not true. And I, and I, I certainly wasn't trying to infer that it was true. What I think they did promise Levi was we're not bringing anyone in here to block you. You'll be given a fair chance to win the job, which I have reported before and said several times. And I believe that is 100% true. And no one has ever disputed that to me. So if anybody misunderstood what I was referring to there, I could have written it a lot more clearly. Anyway, um, you know, again, when you lose that game like you lost to Columbus 9-4 to and he was pulled in the middle of it, again, it brought up that debate should he be here or should he be in the American Hockey League? And even though Buffalo didn't start great on Thursday night, they recovered. They recovered, sure, a lot faster than Toronto did, and so did Levi. And look, I I think the thing about that game for Buffalo, Jeff, is it's been a hard year for the Sabres, and their crowds are down, and I'm not ripping their fans. They have great fans, and it's been a lot of losing. I'm not ripping the fans here. That's a night where all the Toronto fans are coming in. They're looking at all of the, they're looking at all the empty seats. They're looking at the ticket prices. They're like, we can get down to Buffalo, two hour drive. Tickets not expensive. We can get in there and see a team that we can't see at home. And I would just say, if I was a player in that situation, I would, for the Sabres, I would be seeing red. I would be looking around and warm up and I would be telling my teammates, we cannot allow this to happen tonight. Like, I think you know if you're the Sabres, um, you know, there would be people that would get, they'd buy their season's tickets, they'd keep 38 games, and they'd sell the other three uh, to the Toronto fans, and they'd make all their money back. That happened for years. But when you're good and your fans are in there and the Leaf fans are in there, I think you can tolerate that to some degree. But when you're not very good and the fans are staying away and the Leaf fans are coming because they're like, oh, it's so cheap to buy these tickets, you'd be like, no, not tonight. I'm not standing for this. I'm not putting up for this. We are not losing this game. And especially after the loss they had earlier this week to the Blue Jackets, like I don't know where this is going to go for Buffalo this year, but you have to make a stand on a night like this and saying, I am not rolling over for the Toronto Maple Leafs and their fans. And that's the way I would feel if I was a player on the team. And the way Ocposo looked when he scored that goal. Oh, he's laughing. It was the 6-3 goal. He's just laughing. Well, also, like, he was, like, he was fist pumping. He had a nasty look on his face. Like, it was meaningful to him, and it should be. That's To me, that's a pride game for Buffalo, just like Saturday night for Toronto is going to be a pride game against Columbus because they just got their asses kicked. Yeah. Um, well, one final thing on this, and I, I want to move on to a couple of other things, mainly Edmonton and New Jersey here. Um, what are the chances that on Wednesday, March the 6th, which is the next time these two teams meet, and that one is in Toronto, Mm-hmm. The in-house entertainment has saber dance queued up in case the Maple Leafs are running away with it. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Oh yeah, this is hockey now, and I love it. Maybe they'll serve chicken wings <laughs> if Toronto goes up four goals. Like some player just on the ice will eat one. Oh my in goodness! The goal celebration. I, I I can I, if if I'm working for the Maple Leafs, that's what I have queued up for that one. But then the Toronto Maple Leafs, the players themselves, have to live up to their end of the bargain. Well, living up to their end of the bargain and ending their three-game losing streak, the Edmonton Oilers uh, beat the New Jersey Devils. Um, This was an interesting game. 6-3 is the final score. Um, Three goals in 69 seconds. Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Adam Ernie turned a 3-2 deficit into a 5-3 lead. 6-3 is the final score. Your thoughts on this one, Akira Schmid. Um, started for the New Jersey Devils. Um, Calvin Pickard goes for the Edmonton Oilers. Your thoughts on this one? Oh, I mean, there's some rumors out there that Lindy Ruff is in trouble. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you something. Do you think that's fair? I don't because I think, but then again, I think this about a lot of coaches. I think that Lindy Ruff is getting, yeah. is getting goalied. 
like Akira Schmidt got the quick yank, but I mean, listen, I don't think they have much faith in him, and I don't think they have much faith in Vitek Vanacek being anything more than maybe a backup goaltender, as harsh as that may sound. Again, like how many coaches have you seen fall victim to bad goaltending? And that's what's happening with the New Jersey Devils. Not only that, hang on, let me pause on this one. Not only that, I want to swing back to Lindy Ruff here in a second. But I think that the most under-discussed story of huge significance in the NHL is the loss of Dougie Hamilton with the New Jersey Devils. I thought you were going to say Timo Meyer. Dougie Hamilton. Don't you think? That is a number one well, it's defenseman. A big, it's a big loss. I, th- see, I think it's enormous. I think it's, it's gigantic. And you couple that with the goaltending... Maybe we shouldn't be so surprised that the New Jersey Devils are are struggling and aren't the spot that we thought they'd be in. Well, that was a that was a bad loss. There, there's no question about that. It, it was a really bad loss. And again, Calvin Pickard, he's now won three out of four um, in Edmonton's net. He's bought them time. Um, I think it's great. I'm yeah, happy for him. Yeah, I, I say good for him. Like good for Pickard. Um, New Jersey here, the biggest challenge that you face is you're not allowed to go backwards, right? Correct. They made the second round last year. You're not allowed to go backwards. You're not allowed, and, but hang on, you're not allowed to, but you know what the history of hockey is with developing teams? What's that? Bunny hops. Two bunny hops forward, three bunny hops backwards, one bunny hop forwards, two bunny hops backwards. Like, that's, I know you're quote unquote not allowed. An expectation is that you develop and your development only goes one direction. But history tells us that's not true. It's not even yeah, close yeah, to but true. I, I, you're, just, you're talking about fairy tale land and I'm talking about the real world. Like oh, yeah. you're, you're really not allowed to go backwards. <laughs> and, you know, you know, here's the thing. Um, you know, Lindy Roth a couple of years ago, his status there looked uncertain and Jack Hughes really backed him. And he stayed. Mm -hmm. And last year, remember, after two games, it was the fire Lindy and Tom Fitzgerald was like, is everybody crazy? It's it's two games into the season and let's calm it down. And they go to the the second round. And then the sorry sorry Lindy chance too. Let's not forget about those. Yeah, then the sorry Lindy chance. You know, they they go to the second round. Roth got a short extension. Which I, you know, he had this year. I think he got one year and an option. I'm not 100% positive, but I believe that's kind of what it is in that area. And Travis Green comes in um, as an assistant, sort of like in some people's eyes, coach and waiting, right? That whenever it happens, you know, he's your guy. So there's this kind of thing here that if that you if you need a succession plan, you kind of have one. The, the thing is, like, I don't think people like Lindy Ruff go from smart to dumb in six months. I think that New Jersey has flaws, some of it because of injury and some of it because of performance, that they didn't have last year that now all of a sudden they're dealing with. And, you know, you look at Edmonton and you talk about all the coaching changes this year. I think Edmonton would be the one that everybody would say, wow, that was fast, and they just felt, you know what, we don't like the way this is going. It's not 100% fair, but we're going to make the change. And, you know, the thing I worry about is when one team does it, does it embolden other people to do it? And, you know, so when I look at Roth, there's enough smoke out there that you wonder, okay, what exactly are we dealing with here? Um like, I just don't see how Lindy Ruff goes from a genius who got them to the second round to a complete idiot six months later. I, I just don't believe that happens. And I would think, you know, like they're, they're, everybody here believes that Dougie Hamilton, at the if he's coming back, he's either coming back right before the playoffs or into the playoffs, they can use the cap space, right? The yep. LTIR space. Yep. Here's the thing, like, you can't even be guaranteed now that you're going to have that. So if you want to save this season, you've got to strike. The way I look at it is, are, are you really going to be able to change enough right now if you just fire the coach? Like Edmonton, 
you knew McDavid was going to get healthy and you knew Ekholm was going to get healthy. That gave you a good chance to get yourself going again. Like to me, it, it with New Jersey, like every team, you've got the injuries, like you said with Hamilton. But even when Hamilton was there, they were struggling and they were not themselves. Like I, I like to me, I think if if you're gonna say we have to salvage this season, you have to make a move, which is hard. I get it, as opposed to changing the coach now does that mean that anyone's going to listen to me no it could happen anyway i guess but i i just like i look at that team and i say they need some help and it that one's just not on the coaching you know jeff like one of the things i'm watching is ottawa um yeah you know a lot of these teams got the got the coach bounces edmonton got the coach bounce mm-hmm. minnesota got the coach bounce now let's St. look at Lewis. ottawa so ottawa St. Louis got the coach bounce, although they got uh, they got pummeled pretty good by Tampa Bay the other night. But Ottawa has now played two games, Arizona and Colorado. Arizona, they had a lead, and they lost the game. Colorado, they had the lead, and they lost the game. Now, Colorado especially is a good team, and Arizona is actually a really improved team. But Jacques Martin, who's one of the best technical coaches I've ever seen, he can't come right in and fix what ailed the senators. Like I said, if you're like Edmonton and your guys get healthy, including the the nuclear weapon of nuclear weapons, you're going to be better and you're going to beat a lot of teams. But if you don't have the personnel to win, a new coach isn't necessarily going to make the difference. And when I look at Jersey and what they've got right now, I see some of the same concerns that Ottawa has. And if if you fire Lindy Ruff, are you really sure that that's going to make the difference you need? Maybe we'll find out if they think so anyway, but watching Ottawa the last two nights has made me wonder about, is New Jersey's problem going to be the same as Ottawa's, that they're just not built enough right now to handle what ails them? I agree with you on Lindy Ruff, and much like I also agree with you as we see with the New York Islanders and Lane Lambert, because let's not forget earlier this season, he heard the chants too uh, from the fans, and then I guess all of a sudden Lane Lambert remembered how to coach again. Uh, And even though the Islanders have maybe the most bizarre record of any team in the NHL, 15, 8, and 9, so spin it whichever way you want, but it is the most bizarre. What what does Lambert have? (laughs) What does he have? He has goaltending. A hundred percent, he does. He's got Sorokin and Varlamov, who've both been great. He's got, he's got goaltending, and he's got Godfather hair. He's got two <laughs> things that are very, very important. But the the other, but no, the, the other, but like that's the thing. He's got those two guys there that that make any coach better. And that's why I come back to and you and I have talked about this here, the radio show, all over the place. If I'm Tom Fitzgerald right now, and what just happened happened against the Edmonton Oilers. Um, and to your point about, you know, the the Lindy Ruff issue being out there and is it going to be enough or not? I, again, I keep coming back to a team like the Calgary Flames. And or maybe it's not Calgary, maybe it's another team, maybe it's Arizona, I don't know. And I just look at, they have players, some on expiring contracts that can help the New Jersey Devils right now. I don't know that Calgary's at the point right now where they're going to throw the, you know, throw the towel in on the season and say, okay, we're getting rid of all these guys because we're getting great offers. But if if I'm New Jersey, like I look at expiring, con- ex- well, that, yeah, that's the obvious one, right? That, I'm like, that, I'm like, like give, I mean, give me the defenseman, what, Tanner, give me the defenseman, and give me the goaltender. What's it going to cost? Yeah, like I think, like I think Tanev is someone else they've considered too, but. But to me, Hannafin screams devils. Mm-hmm. He does. And, um, you know, I think, you know, he's that's where he's from, that part of, well, not exactly New Jersey, but that part of the country, I think that's kind of the area that he wants to play, uh, that part of the league. You know, it just, Hamilton's a righty shot. And Hannafin's a lefty shot, so it's not apples to apples. But 
they could use a player like him. Like, like, like I'll tell you when when Noah Hannafin was drafted, like one guy who I really trust, who really nails a lot of players, said he's going to play in the NHL for fifteen years. But I'm not sure, like, how high a level is he going to be an A plus guy? Is he going to be a B guy? Says I wasn't sure. Like I've been really impressed by Noah Hannafin in Calgary. Like even though, you know, everybody kind of understands he's going to move on, he still played really well. Like to me, Noah Hannafin is a professional, and that's a very big compliment to me. He's in in good times and in bad times, he's given Calgary everything they could have wanted, and I I just think that if you're New Jersey. You know, that's the kind of guy that you you need at this point in time. Now, again, it comes down to, does New Jersey think it's really important to make a big deal to salvage this season? Does any part of them sit there and say, you know what, this isn't the year, but because they've got Hughes signed a long time, they've got Meyer signed a long time, they've got Hamilton signed a long time, they've got Hisher signed a long time. Like, maybe they look at it and say, hey, we're going to play out this year and not, you know, shoot our shot. Maybe this isn't the time. But, you know, I'll bet you that you could trade for that guy and have a long conversation with him about, do you want to stay here? Do you want, like, is this the kind of place you envision yourself being? Like, to me, Hannafin, if the Devils want that jolt on to improve their defensive play right now, he is the obvious guy to me, mm-hmm. the obvious guy. New Jersey does have their first round pick, we should point out as well. Um, okay, uh, off of that page. Oh, real quick thought on the Oilers ending their three-game skid. We've talked plenty about how they cannot afford at all um, to have any prolonged losing streak. They went from being... One guy who sent me a DM this week, Jeff, yeah? and he said, too much Oilers, please. Enough with the Oilers for one podcast, so I'm going to listen to him. You're letting one guy on Twitter dictate your editorial on this podcast. Don't we all? <laughs> well, this must Don't be... Don't we all over-listen to one person on Twitter? This this must be a very important person. Well, congratulations, the Oilers three-game losing. Listener. losing. Pickard streak. gave them a win. Like I said, that's the that's the conversation. Was it Gary Lawless who sent you that DM? Enough talking about Edmonton. <laughs> no, Talk more about no. Vegas. Okay, Vegas lost to Tampa tonight, Gary Lawless. What about that? And speaking of needing goaltending help, holy how, smokes. How about that in Tampa? K- Kucherov <laughs> getting a penalty from the bench. Everyone's cranky. Elliot, everyone's mad. Everyone's upset. Everyone, I don't know. Like, we're so close to a little bit of a break here to pause, and everyone's just K- I, I badly want Kucherov on this podcast. Eh? I've, a- I've asked for him before. Yeah, I would love it. Uh, I, I think our He's one of my it. dream guests. Uh, he's one of my dream guests. Because I... First of all, I think that guy is really smart, and second, God only knows what he would say. Uh, he's a he's a dream guest of mine. But you know, Cooper was furious too. Like you don't see that many penalties anymore from a guy sitting on the bench. Mm-hmm. Um, That's you know what that was. That was Rashid Wallace <laughs> yelling, "Ball, don't lie," because they're winning four to two. He gets that penalty. They score a power play goal, Vegas, then they tie it, and then Tampa wins in regulation. If Rasheed Wallace was there, he'd be yelling, ball, don't lie. Although Vegas drew up a great face-off play and almost scored. It almost got through Vasilevsky. That was a that was a hell of a game. Kucherov this year, not getting enough credit for how good he's been. Oh, I don't know. We're talking about him in the Hart Trophy, man. I still don't think he's getting enough credit. He's been exceptional. Like he's hard trophy good. He's hard trophy good this year. Uh, but then again, there's a lot of people in that conversation. We'll see how the the second half sifts itself out. But first half, if you're awarding the uh, the heart trophy on New Year's Day, he's right there. It'd be tough not to vote. I'll for tell him. you something else too. You know who's owed a heart trophy? Who's that? Owed it. Nathan McKinnon. Yeah. You know how I feel about McKinnon. I mean, it must be, I've always said this about Nathan McKinnon. It must be a really nice feeling to sit on the bench and say, I'm going to go out there and get two points on my next next shift and then just be able to do it single-handedly. Like when he starts galloping, like there are very few players you look at in the NHL and you can say, yeah, that guy gallops. Nathan McKinnon gallops. 
like he gallops like a horse and when he starts like the body start bouncing off him like i've compared him to a rhinoceros before and i don't know that there's anyone that comes close to skating to skating with as much offensive physicality if i can use that phrase offensive physicality as mckinnon like you cannot touch him when he gets ahead of steam he just goes through guys it's phenomenal to watch and every game there, there's every a game. gm who says to me there's a gm who says to me who are you gonna shaft this season like you shafted nathan mckinnon <laughs> one year i didn't know you were that cozy with joe sakic yeah, <laughs> it actually, he's not the GM anymore. <laughs> no, it's, know, Chris it's Chris McFarland, McFarland but but, uh, but, it, but, it, but it's not him. You know, the other one I thought tonight that was really interesting in terms of like, Kucherov being angry was, uh, and you pointed out to me, because I was driving home and, and didn't see it initially, was Bogosian Gallagher. Okay, how did you see all that? Because you've seen the clip since we talked about it. So I think this is a reflection of what we saw uh, earlier uh, earlier last week. But how, with good Branson, with good, yeah, with good Branson and, and Nick Cousins, the two now, situations now, are not hang exact, on. Let, but let, I see where you're going. Let me with point this. out, like, good, I see where good you're Branson going. had time to sit and calm down, but instead yes. he chose violence and went at Cousins afterwards. This was more spontaneous, but nonetheless, to me, this was players taking this into their own hands. So the difference is, as you said, that Good Branson and Cousins were in the penalty box, and then Good Branson came out and and made a beeline for Cousins and uh, went as as I wrote Grand Theft Auto Six on him, which the NHL said we cannot allow that to happen. Um, but um, you know, this was a situation where now the hits were not similar. Like Cousins had a lot more of a head of esteem than Gallagher did. But Gallagher did go in high, which is what Good Branson really argued with. Uh, Good Branson actually gave me a demonstration in the Columbus room about how he would try to hit a player in that situation, go in hips first with his skates on the ground and not high so that it, it would limit the potential injury. And, you know, Gallagher did go in higher. He, he lifted. And, you know, Bogosian threw a couple punches. It wasn't... You know, Gallagher didn't fight, but it wasn't the same level as Good Branson and and Cousins. With the, and Bogosian with, got four minutes. With the 12 to 6 punches? <laughs> yeah, well, it's because he did, it wasn't quite as the same level. 12 really o'clock, 6 o'clock. 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock. But he did, 12 he o'clock, did throw 6 them. o'clock. Yes. Oof. I, uh, come on, I'm conceding to you on some level right. here. But, um, so he got four minutes, unlike Good Branson who got suspended a game, but... I will tell you, I got some interesting reaction to that part of the column where players talked about how if they're going to be policed, they can't be suspended or questioning how the only guys who got suspended were uh, the guys who were policing it. Because, you know, one player said to me and he didn't, you know, he said, you can't say who I am or what team I'm on. And I said, no problem. And he said, you can't even use the incident because they'll know. And I, I said, okay, no problem. But there was a situation where one team didn't like a hit from another player. And they, you know, they went to the official about it. And the official said, look, that's not a penalty and not a suspension. And basically it was implied, if not said, he wouldn't tell me that you guys, on some level, you guys have to police this. And, you know, then you take a look and you see the two guys who got suspended were Perron, although, again, Perron made a big mistake and deserved a suspension, and Good Branson, who a lot of people, I think, it's very clear to me a lot of players around the league supported what Good Branson did. And so I thought it was really interesting. You know, Bogosian got four minutes. Obviously, he wasn't kicked out of the game. There won't be any supplemental discipline for that. Um, but, um, Jeff, I... I just thought it was really interesting. And I had a few people reach out to me about that. A couple asked me for a bit more information about the what the players said. And I'm just wondering if, you know, defending yourself or taking it into your own hands 
uh, if that means we might see a change in the way that's looked at, or is someone going to say, you know what, these guys are right. I don't know. It's too soon to know what the answer is here, but I did have a few people reach out to me about it. Uh, that game had some pretty rough stuff in it. Like it was a really entertaining game and Marco Rossi was really good. Kirill Kaprizov was really good. Matt Boldy uh, was really good. Uh, nice to see Yuri Slavkovsky find the, find the back of the net. Um, but Caden Gooley, Gets a good lick in on Kaprizov. Marco Rossi comes good for Marco sc- Rossi. screaming in in a situation where he knows he's given up a lot of size and weight. And, you know, what happened in the fight is pretty much what you would expect would happen in a fight uh, between Caden Gooley and, and Marco Rossi. So that, that was a really rough one as well. But just wanted to point one other thing out about that Minnesota-Montreal game. It's because you wrote about him in 32 Thoughts, the blog at sportsnet.ca. Do you see Brock Faber's minutes again tonight? Uh, over 30. 33, 25. <laughs> it's you incredible. Know, like, I, I got to tell you, like, it's going to be really hard. Oh. It, it, it's going to be really hard to beat Bedard this year. Really hard. And, and I'll tell you something, too. Like, to be honest, I don't know if I have a vote this year. I, I may not. But if I was voting, I, I know how this is going to go over. This is going to be spectacular. I would take into consideration all the extra work Bedard has done. Like all the extra media, um, you know, everything that's kind of happened around him this year, I think he should get credit for that. And if I was voting, and I understand that not everybody would agree with me, and that's fine, but it, it would be my vote, my opinion. I would factor in all of the extra media he's gone through this year and all the other things he's taken on his shoulders. I think that's a factor. It would matter to me if I was voting. Now, I know some people are going to hear that and say, you're a complete idiot and it shouldn't matter. I think it's going to be very difficult to beat Bedard for Rookie of the Year this year, but I give this credit to Faber. You know, he he's making a real run at it. Like, Jeff, the people in Anaheim and yourself, like the true scouting geeks, you know Minchikov. I don't know him that well. He's good, man. You know, he's... He he's like 0.55 points a game as a rookie defenseman. Best defenseman in the OHL. I, I counted. Last year. There's I think best defenseman yeah, in the OHL. Ten last guy, year. ten, ten rookie D's in the in the cap era that are better than that. It's incredible. Like there, there's there's a great group of young players, but to me, again, there's still 50 games to go. But I think I think it's gonna be really tough to beat beat Bedard this season. But there's going to be some strong cases made for Brock Faber if it continues like this. This is, this is super impressive. Okay, Ellie, let's wrap up here. Uh, A few things from your blog and a couple of things outside of your blog. Uh, What about, first of all, tough one for Carolina. They lose to the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, Kachetkov was really good in the game, but nonetheless, I, it was funny when the game went into overtime I got a tweet from someone saying, are you going to jinx overtime again for us in Carolina? So I stayed away. I didn't talk about Ajo and Natchez. And then the, anyhow, and Pittsburgh Penguins ended up winning that game. Um, but there are some questions about the future for netminder Frederick Anderson. What do you hear? What do you know? Yeah, I've had a few Carolina fans reach out to me to explain a bit more about that. And, I, and I'm happy to do it. Um, you know, Don Waddell said earlier this week that um, he's been given the all clear to resume skating. And like, and to be honest, like I, I'm not casting aspersions on anybody. I just couldn't find the original note. So I just want, like, I'm not questioning anybody here. I just I can't find the original note. But it basically said he could be back in a month. There was a, there was a report that came out. I just had a couple of people just say to me, be very careful with the timeline here. And because I don't think anybody really knows, like these are blood clots, right? And, um, you know, my favorite blood clot story. And I, I imagine that a lot of people don't have a favorite blood clot story. Oh, I thought but everybody my favorite did. One was when, <laughs> when Dimitri Yuskevich played for the Maple Leafs, um, he tried to play with one and like he threw a fit when they told him he couldn't play. And they said, like, Dimitri, if you get cut, you could bleed out. And he's like, I'm willing to risk it. I know. He was, and they were like, okay, yeah. no, like, that's not happening. So, and like, and people said, like, if you, I remember a player told me that if you could have seen this argument, you still wouldn't have believed that it was actually occurring. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but like, blood clots are, you know, a, a, a serious thing. And, and 
All I can tell you is I had some people say, just be very careful on the timeline. Like people are hopeful Anderson will be able to play and resume his career, but nobody really knows for sure. So that's what I'm being careful about. Okay. Um, A couple of things from the blog. Um, SAP Arena in Munich, Global Series to Germany. Yeah, Munich appears to be on the list, Jeff. And, um, you know, they... They're building a new arena there, Um, the SAP Center, uh, you know, um, Red Bull, the team that's playing there, and I think also the basketball team um, that uh, plays there are going to be in that arena, Um, and it's going to be ready for next season, and I know some people who went and toured it, and they said it's spectacular, and the word out there is that NHL teams will be coming. And of course, there are German players in the NHL. It's a good mm-hmm. place to go to. It, it makes a lot of sense. So it's definitely on the radar. Okay, if they go there, here's my prediction. Here's Jeffy throwing darts. Mm-hmm. Here, are, here are your four teams. Ottawa Senators, okay. Edmonton Oilers, yep. Chicago Blackhawks, yep. San Jose Sharks. I mean, all of that makes sense. All of it makes sense. I'm just saying, tuck it away. If it happens, let's remember this conversation. If it doesn't, this conversation never happened. Um, Nolan Patrick, what's the story yeah. on Nolan Patrick? So I, I, I kind of feel badly. I don't know how this story started, but obviously I saw all the tweets And then someone said to me, um, you know, there's a company he's working for. And I guess uh, a member of the social media team uh, tweeted out that he had retired and he was uh, joining the organization to, um, you know, teach young players, which is very good and noble. And I didn't think much of it. And I tracked down his phone number and I texted him and I said, hey, could I just talk to you about your career and, and how you're doing? And you know, he wrote back pretty quickly and he said, um, look, um, I didn't uh, I didn't announce my retirement. I haven't decided anything and I just prefer not to talk right now. And I said, no problem. Um, and, and I told him I was going to put it in my notes that he actually hadn't retired. And he said, fine, no issue. And I just said, look, leave it open ended. When you're ready to talk, I, I'd love to talk. And um you know, as someone told me, he's really private. He's a really quiet guy. Like you would, pro- you've had more experience with him, Jeff. I know oh, you did that memorial he was, cup where he was there. So yeah, and listen, that was uh, that would have been uh, Red Deer. I want to say 2016. That, and that, that was the one that London won with Marner and Kachuk and Dvorak, right? That was the top line in junior hockey. Yeah, they were outstanding. Um, but yeah, uh, get getting there, like Brandon getting to the getting to the Memorial Cup. Nolan Patrick was on a completely different level. Like it's one of the best perfor- single performances we've seen of any player uh, in Western Hockey League playoff history. He was an absolute force. Uh, Thirty points. Brandon just marched to the Memorial Cup, postseason MVP. He was he was phenomenal, Elliot, and he was like big and strong and physical and skilled. Like you watch this guy in junior, but a and quiet you say guy, right? Really quiet guy. It really, I had a, a few conversations with him. Um, one really good, nice conversation with him at a uh, at, at a banquet. Um, but yeah, uh, really quiet. Um, not that he was like you know shy or anything like that, but he could just tell like he's got a quiet confidence. But you can tell that he's not the most outgoing person in the room. How's that? Yeah, that's fair. And, and I had some people like tell him. me that. Like, like I like him. I, yeah. I, I always wanted that guy hey, to do well. Not, not everybody is is Kevin Bieksa or Nick Kiprios, right? Like yeah. there's there's people who just prefer to be quiet. And, you know, somebody said to me that, um, you know, he wouldn't like all that attention, especially if he hadn't retired. He, he wouldn't like um, all of that attention. And then what happened was, I guess, you know, people started contacting his family and somebody called me on Patrick's behalf and said, look, can you put out that tweet? Um, because he just wants like people to stop contacting him and his family. And, you know, I wasn't crazy about it because, look, I know what it's like to get something wrong. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like to contribute to that on social media. 
and um, but clearly his family was getting overwhelmed. So I just figured it was, you know, the better thing to do. And um, you know, someone said to me too, you know, he's 25 years old. He just turned 25 in September. They said, you know, why would he file retirement papers? Like he's still young enough that if he decides he wants to go back and try again at some point, you know, why not? And actually thought that made a lot of sense. Like who knows how he's feeling now and he's battled a lot of health issues, but maybe somewhere down the road, he'll be able to get uh, healthy enough or he'll say, you know, I really miss it. I want to try to play somewhere where I might love it and try something out and and hopefully someday that can happen for him, health permitting. Um, The one thing I thought was really interesting is young players are going to be able to submit video to him and he's going to look at it, which is great. He's going to pass on the knowledge. That's awesome. Um, Okay, Ottawa Senators. Um, One of the names you brought up in your notes, John Gruden. Now, we've talked about John Gruden before. This is for the coaching position, and we'll see how this all sorts itself out, whether it happens um, during the season, whether it happens uh, after the season, we'll see what happens. Um, but John Gruden um, very much knows Michael Andlauer and Steve Steos. Uh, he coached for the team they own in the OHL, uh, then Hamilton, now Brantford Bulldogs. Um, he's the coach of the AHL Toronto Marlies, and he would have to be considered, how shall we say it, Elliot, a person of interest for the Ottawa Senators. I think he's got a shot at that job. You know, I I do think this, I think the Senators, one thing it's very clear, like someone said to me, if they wanted Woodcroft, if they wanted um, Everson, or they wanted somebody who was available now, they could have hired them already. And I don't, yeah, I I guess that's true in Ottawa's case, but I, I don't think they want to think like that. Like they know Ottawa's identified its young core. It's Stutzla, it's Kachuk, it's Norris, it's Batherson, it's Pinto, it's Sanderson, it's it's Chikrin, it's Shabbat. And, you know, Ridley Gregg, I think, is a guy who's really coming. Someone said, what about Zub? He's a little bit older, but, you know, obviously I think Zub's a really good player too. They have one shot to get this right with a coaching hire to make sure that when these guys are in their prime, they're going to be able to win. They are not going to rush into anything, I don't think. Um, you know, the one thing that could change here is if, you know, if they get a chance to talk to Gruden in season and he knocks their socks off, I guess that could always happen, possibly. But the one thing that they have said to people is, we have to get this right. There is a There's a realization that of all of the things that Ann Lauer and Steos are going to do, this is the most important, getting the coach right from a hockey point of view. Like people talk about the GM, Steos is going to be the boss. He's going to be running the show. You've already got the boss in place. This is the person who's going to run your bench, hopefully for five to 10 years. And I and I think there's a real, like, like I said, the... The sentence coming out of Ottawa is, we've got to get this right. And they're right. They they absolutely do. Okay. Um, we've seen, you know, we've seen players on a different topic here. We've seen players before, you know, comment about their team. We've seen players comment about coaches. We've seen comment. We've seen players comment on a lot of things after losses. But Devon Taves going at his players on the Colorado Avalanche this week was unique, essentially saying there's a lot of guys here that think they're playing a lot better than they actually are, which is a pretty yeah. unique twist on how to how to take a swipe at your team. What a weird year in Colorado. It's eh? been, well, it's been bizarre. And you listen, you you've written about it and you've you know, you've talked about it uh, Saturday on on headlines. Um, the idea of what's next for Colorado. You know, earlier in this podcast, you brought up Nathan McKinnon, and listen, he goes out and scores four goals um, on Thursday night. They beat the Ottawa Senators 6-4. Miko Rantanen uh, has the other two as well. And I, I think we're all waiting here now for the next shoe to drop in Colorado. They have to be looking. Lindholm is, you know, one of the more obvious names that's out there. You know, what do you think McFarlane and Sackick have up their sleeve here? 
Well, I think one of the things that they have to deal with is cap. They don't have a lot of it. One of the challenges for them will be doing anything quickly. Like they are, and they've built up the points, right? They've banked the points. They don't have to rush. But I think that the teams who've talked to them know that they can't necessarily race into anything because they don't have the cap room to do it. But it, it, there's definitely a feeling that when teams are ready to deal, um, make sure Colorado knows because they want to know when they absolutely have to do something. Like, I, I think they're in on Lindholm. I, you know, he's a perfect fit for what they need. You know, I talked about it the other the other podcast. Um, but, you know, I, like, he fits w- what, they, what they could really use. I just think that, I mean, I, it's almost like an NBA team this year. Like, you look at, like, the beef of someone's relative saying something that pisses <laughs> off a player. Like, that's right out of the NBA, man. Of course, like, yeah. Th- that is there. I tried to find out who Taves was talking about the other day, but there was some real omerta there. It was like, yeah, you're you're not finding out. Like, we're not telling you who that is. So, but clearly the message was received. But that's all. It was also very NBA. Like, it's it, it's it's pretty interesting how. I mean, maybe the uh, the Avalanche saw the Nuggets win the NBA championship last year, and they have to take some of that personality into their game. The other thing it says to me about them is they're not satisfied. They are absolutely, they won a Stanley cup two years ago. And you know, last year you have your hangover and everything and you lose Landis Gog and it's hard to win. And I, I think everybody recognizes what a big loss Landis Gog is for them. Yeah. Th- there's, they're not buying any more excuses this year, Jeff, like the, the years of the excuse, they had their one year of excuses. You know, that's, that's over. And, not winning this year is not acceptable. And I do think they're going to try to do some things. You, you take a look. They've got three players forwards in the top seven of ice time among forwards. The the Maple Leafs are the only other team that has three in the top 20 and Nylander's 20th. So I think, the, I mean, you can't do that all year. Even a guy like McKinnon will burn out. And in the postseason, especially if you're going to run into Vegas, what is the thing that Vegas beats you with the most? It's depth. So I think they know they're going to have to do something and they will do something. Um, but a lot of what I've seen this year is uh, uh, the pride of a team that is is letting everybody know that they don't want to be gas in the wind. They want to be more than a one-hit wonder. Let's um let's finish up this A block by talking about quickly here uh, the Dallas Stars really exciting overtime win Thursday night against the Vancouver Canucks uh, boy did, did Thomas Harley ever look good uh, in in this game um, but you wrote in your notes about Maverick Bork and Logan Stankoven about how they're pushing and how do you get them into the lineup and the problem listen the problem with Dallas is they don't have any salary cap space like it's gonna take um, it's gonna take an injury. Um, to to make this happen or a trade uh, to make this happen. But make no mistake about it. Like, I think you're bang on with this. These guys look like they at least deserve a look up with the big club. Well, and I think they're going to play sooner or later, right? Like both those kids are going to be NHL players. Now, one of the issues with Dallas is they're capped tight, so it's not easy to do it. They're going to have to do something to create room for them. Like, I haven't seen a lot of them, but a, a couple of people have mentioned them to me now for, for a couple weeks straight. Like, you got to get these guys in your notes. You know, I have to say this. I did get a long uh, note from someone who's been a longtime reader of the blog, and he said, I hope you take this as a constructive criticism. Whenever someone starts a sentence like you're that, getting, I'm like, oh, you're getting where's blasted. this going? You're getting blasted. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, honestly, I, I just think there's there's too many teams that don't get mentioned enough in your blog. And I kind of thought about it. And, uh, and you know what? It's probably a fair criticism. Like, it's always going to skew heavy towards Canada because I'm based in Canada and I deal with the teams more. But you know what? I, th- I think it's true. I, I think it's a fair critique and it's something I'm going to try to change next season but you know so i was thinking about the dallas and people were talking about those two guys and they happen to have a huge game this week against grand rapids 
But, you know, one of the things I've heard is that, you know, they, they don't have any shorthanded goals or anything like that this year, but I've heard Texas has started to put them out on the penalty kill. And like, cause you know, if, if you're going to go up there and play for Peter DeBoer and Peter DeBoer and the, and the Sharks want to win a Stanley cup, he's not going to use you if you're one hit wonders, right? Like you're not going to play for a coach like that. So I think it's really smart. And you know, these are two of the best, like people think that Bork in particular could be the MVP of the, of the American hockey league this year. Um, I, I'm just curious to see how long it's going to last. And, and like I said, one coach made the joke about, I can't wait that I'm, rid of those guys because uh because they're too good uh they're excellent and they're right there and i think a lot of us are, are waiting for them to finally get called up you know you mentioned that game against grand rapids and there's one more player that i, w- I would add to your list respectfully and that is you know um the goaltender uh remy poirier who you know every time i you know uh, do a do a check-in it's, you know, we all think that this is going to be the next backup for uh, for Jake Ottinger. That, that's how well Remy Poirier is playing. And he had another big one. Uh, you mentioned that game against Grand Rapids. He was, he was excellent in that game as well. So don't be surprised if that's another name out of Dallas because they need more great kids like Leon Bichelle's playing, you know, 26 minutes where he's playing and uh, Thomas Harley starting to pop on the blue line like it's an embarrassment of riches. Uh, for young kids coming up and and playing well with the big squad. But Remy Poirier is uh, another name we should probably start to get ourselves acquainted with. Okay, on that, we'll uh, we'll wrap up the A Block here. Back with the Montana's Thought Line in the B Block in a moment. Listen to the 32 Thoughts podcast ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Okay, Elliot, here we go. Once again, time now for the Montana's Thought Line presented by Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue. Take it away, Freach. Try the ribs. 32. And, oh, yeah. And I just like to say something here. You know who wanted to try the ribs this week? <laughs> who? <laughs> Dave Maloney from the New York Rangers, Rangers. broadcast team. They hey. were in town. Nice. And what Dave told me was, unfortunately, you know, fighting uh, to get downtown in Toronto traffic and rush hour, not easy. There was no Montana's, unfortunately, close to the Rangers Hotel, so we couldn't go. But the Rangers come back in March, I think right before the trade deadline, right around there anyway. And I think Montana's should hook up Dave Maloney and the entire Rangers broadcast team and traveling oh. party. Wow. With some ribs, because he specifically sought me out to say he wanted to try the ribs. Okay, is there any truth to the rumor that uh, Sam Rosen was curious about the pecan salad? No, because he's a lot smarter than that. Okay, very good. The fried pickles, maybe? Sam want some of that? Loving? No, maybe. All right, we move along. No, athletes need protein. They want the ribs. Yes, because that's the only place you can get protein. I was going to yeah, say, right. Elliot, there's no you, you other protein, protein in the world except ribs. <laughs> According to the books I read, that's what I read on Wikipedia. <laughs> no study that I've ever believed has concluded anything other than protein only comes from ribs. 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca, 1 833 311 3232. I just love it. 32 thoughts at sportsnet.ca, 1 833 Three one one three two three two. Uh, Amisha from Brampton submits this. Hi there, Amisha from Brampton here. I want to start by saying love the podcast, all the work you guys put into it. My question is based on something that happened in one of my games last weekend. Keep in mind, it's just U18 girls double B. So my team had a delayed penalty called on us and the play was in our end. The other team missed a pass to their D on the point and the puck was slowly going down towards their now empty net as the goalie had left to get the extra skater on. One of my teammates was out skating their defense. Now, obviously, if she possesses the puck on her stick, then the whistle would blow. But what if she just dove on the ice or tripped without actually possessing the puck and it went in? 
Would that be a goal mm. in the NHL? I feel like our refs would have called it a goal, but of course, we aren't in the NHL. Thanks again, Jelly Dom. That's catching on. Keep up the great work. Do you have a thought on this one? I think it depends on the official because as you know, Jeff, there are some referees who want possession and there are some who say, no, you just touched it. That's enough. So I, uh, I was wondering about this one as well. My instinct was no goal. Um, cause I don't think it necessarily has just to do with possession. So I reached out to our mutual buddy, Dave Jackson, uh, who mm -hmm. does work with ESPN, former NHL referee. Let me read to you what he texted me back. This is for you, Amisha. No goal. The team getting the penalty can have no effect on the puck going in the net. And the fact that mm. obviously your team may would have tripped accidentally without actually possessing the puck and it goes in or dove on the ice. Um, that means they've had an effect on it. And then he gave me a great example. Think about this one. I had never thought about this before, but it does make a lot of sense. Okay, I'll go one further. This is Dave Jackson. I'll go one further. Team getting the power play is skating out from behind their own net. Okay, Elliot, so the team that's about to have the power play is skating out from their, behind their own net. The team getting the penalty body checks the puck carrier. He falls and knocks the puck into his own net. Do you know what the call is? No, what's that? Still no goal. Even though the other team never touched the puck, the only way it counts is if they put the puck in their own net with zero input from the penalized teams. You can have no input into the goal. It doesn't have to be touched. Even if you body check someone and the puck goes in the net because of it, it is still ruled no goal. Amisha, thank you for that question. I can't believe some of the stuff that people think of. I, I, I really it. don't. I, I, I know it. you do. I, I, I have it. to say it's twisted in its own way. It's really <laughs> twisted in its own way. I don't know whether to respect it or be disgusted by it. It's probably both. <laughs> it's the holiday season. Be respectful. Okay. Uh, Amisha, thanks for that question. See, sometimes I love talking to people that ask questions that challenge a lot of my assumptions about the game or present different scenarios because then it leads to things like that. Okay. Garnet in Peterborough. While listening to the last podcast, I couldn't help but notice that Jeff says Jersey. I know. And I always try to catch myself too. I can't believe that a hockey nerd wouldn't say it's a hockey sweater, but yeah, Cherry like, was big about that. Don big, Cherry always said sweater. It's a sweater. It's not a Jersey. Uh, but my question is, this is Garnet again. Is there a rule that says nameplates have to be on the back of the sweater? I just think the Canadian sweater would look better with just a number the way that the Yankees uniform does. Good job, everybody. Garnet and Peterborough. Freach. There is a rule. And the reason I remember there's a rule is, do you remember what Harold Ballard did with the Maple Leafs when we were kids? Very creative. And you can explain the reason why, too. A blue nameplate on a blue jersey so you couldn't <laughs> see it. So what happened was, what Elliot is talking about. had to buy about, more programs. In, in the 70s, the NHL mandated that all the sweaters had to have nameplates on them. And Ballard, Harold Ballard, the late owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs, felt that that would hurt program sales. So as a way to, I guess, you know, tweak the nose of the NHL, he said, okay, fine, I'll put the nameplate on because it didn't specify that if you're wearing a blue jersey, it had to be white letters. So he put blue letters on a blue jersey, white letters on a white jersey. So no one could see it. It's program sales were still robust, Elliot. Ballard. That's all I can say. <laughs> okay, here's one for you. Here's one for you. Uh, Philip from Slovakia. Hey guys, longtime listener Philip here from Slovakia. I have two quick questions for you. Elliot mentioned in Friday's podcast that Shane Pinto should be coming back to the city of Ottawa because he'll be allowed to practice with the team again. Question is, is there a difference between, for example, three or 41 game suspension in what players can attend? And what specifically are they banned from except games, of course? The second question for all of you three is, who is your all-time favorite Slovakian player? Thanks for all the responses. And as always, keep up the good work. All three of you doing a great job. Hashtag Let's Go Pens. First one, 
Is there a difference between a three or 41 game suspension and what players are allowed to attend while they are suspended? Basically, what I would say is this. It's that um, for those longer suspensions, like there was, for example, a couple of years ago, there was a performance enhancing substance suspension in the uh, NHL or AHL because it involved the Leafs Marlies. I, I can't remember exactly which at the time. And it was 20 games. And I think it was 10 days before the end of the suspension, the player was was allowed to resume activities with the team. That's the case with um, Pinto. I believe 10 days uh, before the he's eligible to play again, he can start practicing with the team once again. So that's kind of the way it goes. Like he's allowed to go back into the city and, you know, work out on his own and things like that. Um, but 10 days from the end of the suspension, he can begin practicing with the team. Okay. And to the follow-up question for all three of us, and since this hits Dom where he lives and who he is, yeah. favorite Slovakian player of all time. Dom, this is you. You lead. Pavel Dimitra. Oh, such a great choice. That's a great pick. Oh, that's an awesome, awesome choice. That's yeah, a great he pick. Was, he was real good. I, I think, well, listen, we all miss Pavel Dimitra. Um, Elliot, you have a favorite Slovakian player of all time? I, I, I'm loyal to Peter Stasny. I just remember him when he came over and what a great player he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also remember, for different reasons, just the in the 02 Olympics, when unfortunately they had that situation where they couldn't work out for uh, some of the NHL players to play uh, for some of the other teams like Latvia and Slovakia. I just remember Archer Zerbe and, and Stasny, he sat on the bench and eventually he went in and played um, because it was tough for them to see how they couldn't get their full complement of players. And uh, I just always admired both Erbe and Stasny um, for how much it mattered to them. So I'm always a Peter Stasny fan. Uh, same. For me, my default is always Peter Stasny, although huge Marian Hossa fan. But you yep. know who my, my first favorite Slovakian hockey player was? Vladimir Zarilla. Vladimir Zarilla was, I remember the Zarilla. Goaltender, Val, he was the goaltender for Czechoslovakia in the 1976 Canada Cup. And I remember him well for two reasons. One, he terrified me in that game against Team Canada when he shut them out one nothing, And I thought, there's no way anyone's going to score on this guy. Uh, Canada ended up winning that Canada Cup, and then I remember the jersey swap at the end. You know, this is one of the, the one of the great traditions in international hockey uh, when the each team gets together and they swap jerseys. Uh, Rogi Vachon was the goaltender for Canada. Man, what a great tournament he had as well. That made me a huge Rogi Vachon fan. And I just remember because Vlad Zarilla was much bigger than Rogi, mm -hmm. um, them switching jerseys and Rogi wearing this humongous Vladimir Zarilla jersey as uh, Zerilla himself had to squeeze into this tiny uh, little Rogi Vashon jersey. He was a refrigerator repairman by trade mm -hmm. and an international goaltender for uh, Czechoslovakia uh, back in the 70s as well. Him and Yuri Holacek sort of flipped back and forth. But that was my first Slovakian hockey love because he terrified me as a kid, beating, shutting them out. I think it was like 35 saves. Uh, in that game as well. So yeah, Stasny unfortunately, they got him in the final. Like, oh uh, boy, first it was ever. Sittler, <laughs> and then yeah. in the um, <laughs> and then in the other game. But yeah, I, I that's one of the first hockey tournaments I really remember. And me too. I, I do remember Zarilla gaining a ton of fans for how well he played. Uh, he was awesome. Uh, thanks for that one. Much appreciated uh, for that email, Matt in Victoria. Uh, hey guys, love the pod. Massive hockey fan. Eat, live, and breathe hockey. I've had numerous conversations with coworkers, friends, and family this past week in regards to the Luongo Ring of Honor versus retiring his number. Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that teams should honor the amazing players that come through their franchise. However, I do not believe that players should not be able to wear that number again. I'm also a big football soccer fan, and they don't retire numbers in football. Messi grew up watching his idol Maradona and wanted mm. to wear his number 10 shirt to make him proud. Same for Neymar with Pele. Why can't these idols in hockey be remembered but still have children who idolize them and one day want to wear that jersey proud? Maybe that's why Mitch Marner wore 93 watching the Leafs and Doug Gilmore. Obviously, mm -hmm. I don't know that, but you don't know. That's true. I, ju 
I just know my favorite team growing up and still is the Vancouver Canucks. My favorite number still is number 10 because of Pavel Bure. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on retiring numbers. 32 of them. Terrible joke, LOL. Thank you and great job, everyone. Well, that does happen. You know, the Leafs did that for a long time before yep. they took the numbers out of circulation. Uh, so that's definitely occurred. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Taylor Hall, when he went to Edmonton, he wore Kevin Lowe's number four. So it does it does happen here and there. Um, I don't know. I just, I've always had a thing for retired numbers. One of the Sporkle quizzes I always play is, can you name the retired numbers in all these sports? I, I think there is something to going to a game and seeing that banner and trying to understand who that player was. Like one of the stories I did at CBC that I really loved doing was, who was the first number retired in, among the Pittsburgh Penguins? Michelle Briere, number 21. Yeah. Passed away. And just the story about about him and, and who he was. And, you know, the one of the real nice things about uh, that doing that story was, you know, he was a young player who died in a car accident. Um, his girlfriend at the time was was pregnant, and you know, just the the son uh, realizing that people wanted to know about his dad. And um, you know, is that the same if the number's not retired? I don't know, but I've always had a thing for retired numbers, and like you know, Calgary's another team. I think they've only honored Al McInnes and not retired it. I don't know. I, I, I love to see retired numbers. It's a personal preference. Everybody's different, but I love it. The, the the one retired number story that I keep coming back to, and I've never really had a what I consider a satisfactory answer for it, um, is number six with the Detroit Red Wings. And that was Larry Ory, uh, yep. Little Dempsey, as they called him, one of Gordie Howe's favorite players. And a matter of fact, in Detroit, he was Gordie uh, before Gordie came along. That was the style of player that he was. And his number six was retired by former Wings owner James Norris. And then when the Illiches bought the team, the number was unretired, but it is out of circulation. Nobody wears number six, even though it has been unretired by the Detroit Red Wings. I have yet to receive an answer as to why the jersey was unretired and have yet to receive an answer why nobody other than his cousin once in Detroit has ever been able to wear the number six. I still, that's my, it's one of my white whales, Elliot is finding the truth behind the Larry Ori story. One day I'll find it. Today is not that day. If Mickey Redmond can't find out, nobody can. He knows everything <laughs> in Detroit. Help us, Mickey, help <laughs> us with the Larry Ori story. Um, uh, okay. Justin in Newfoundland hearing the conversation on Jeff's show with Eric Engels about Jake Allen emulating Tuka Rask during the 2019 final. And I have a somewhat related question about practicing power plays. When a team is practicing their power play, do they typically work on the penalty kill in their own style simultaneously, or do they try to emulate the basic penalty kill strategy of an upcoming opponent, even if it doesn't necessarily match their own style, may become convoluted during the season, but seems like a fair strategy to deploy during playoff preparation. As always, great job, Jeff Elliott. And New Ammo, P.S., try the ribs. I think I think it happens both ways. I've seen both. I think a lot of it, I, I think that when you're in a when you're in a seven game series, you want to emulate as much as you can. Yep. or do video work around uh, things like which way each penalty killer shoots, which way they hold their stick, um, where they position themselves. I, 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 can, I can see teams trying to emulate um, the penalty kill of, uh, of, of their opposition. That just, that just flat out makes sense. I think it was the Canadians once. I can't remember for sure. But I think they were, I remember them telling me at practice they were going into a playoff series and it was against the Bruins when they were putting Char in front of the net. And they yeah. said, yeah, that's a tough one to emulate. <laughs> I think they said something Just, like Brian Brian Gianta or Mike Camilleri is not going to do it or something like that. We have to go to the zoo to get a giraffe <laughs> and put him in a Bruins jersey, stand him in front of the net. Uh, we'll finish up on this one. Doug in New Jersey. Hello from New Jersey. As a hopeless 
bandwagoner of the devils and a new fan of the league, your pod has been a wonderful resource to learn more about the game and the beautiful and proud nation of Canada. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that one. My question is, when did dad's slash mom's trips become a regular part of the NHL calendar? The Devils had all their fathers go to the games this past Saturday and Sunday, and a lot of funny content has come out of it. Those are always great cutaway shots. I particularly liked how debonair the European dads looked compared to their schlubby American and Canadian counterparts. Some of the Euro dads dress it up, man. They look good. Uh, do you guys have any favorite parents trip stories? You know, I just mentioned white Euros a second well. ago. I, I don't know. Euro, I don't yes. know why, but Euros really dress well compared to a lot of us. Well, sh- we're, we're schlubby here, according to Doug. And I guess so. Sh- schlubby American and Canadian counterparts. Um, you know how a couple of seconds ago I mentioned my white whale with Larry? I have another white whale. Oh, and God. I'm determined to get it how, out of him. How many white whales are there? I got a lot, man. In Moby, in Moby Dick, there was only one. I think you're only allowed to have one. <laughs> Okay, well, this is uh, maybe not a white whale. Gray whale? I don't know. Um, Bruce Boudreaux, and he will not tell me. He like he refuses to tell me who the team was. Um, but it could either only be Washington or Anaheim or Minnesota or Vancouver. In one of his stops with one of these teams, on the dad's trip, the dad's one night went to a bar and got in a full-on bar brawl. And apparently the uh, the players were none too pleased and kind of embarrassed about it the next day. He refuses to tell me, Elliot, and if maybe you're a player from one of those teams and would like to share that information uh, on one of those teams in one of those seasons, Elliot, dad's trip, bar brawl. That's that sounds my- like Anaheim. Look at that team and tell me the fathers wouldn't get into a fight. Uh, I I would say Anaheim, although you know what? Sometimes it's a it's it's what you least expect. Too, I don't know. Maybe it was Washington. Maybe it was Minnesota. Um, could it have been Vancouver? I don't know. Any favorite parent trip stories? One of the first fathers' trips I can remember was when we were working at CBC. And the Red Wings did it in Atlanta. And um, I'll, I'll, I, there were a couple things I remember about that trip. They allowed us to bring the cameras, and we went behind the scenes, and we mic'd up Jimmy Howard's dad for a period while Jimmy was in goal. And I regretted that because I just thought I think it was too hard on Jimmy Howard's dad. Like, it was, it was really tough for him to have the mic on him. And we took it off after 20 minutes, and I was like, uh, I, I remembered filing that in my head and saying, we're not doing that again if we ever get this opportunity. Um, the thing I remember about that trip is Steve Eiserman was hurt. And so he went on the bus to the game with the fathers. And those fathers were in awe of Steve Eiserman. Hmm. And he treated them really well and he i remember they they would ask him like some of them were really shy to ask about their son and whoever did ask i remember i think one of the dads if i remember correctly was brett lebda's dad oh yeah and like he just asked like what's it like to play with my son i heard this conversation we didn't have the mic on it and eiserman talked about brett lebda like in just in glowing terms and the dad was beaming and then a couple more of the dads finally got the confidence, you know, to, uh, to to ask, okay, what's it like to play with my son? And he made those dads feel great. I could totally see someone like Bieksa just carving like the, the kids <laughs> to, their, to their dads, but Iserman wasn't doing that. I always remember that one. But the other thing I remember about that trip was we had a problem with the tape. What, like we shot it like on three or four tapes. And one of the tapes that had really good stuff on it, it had a problem with it. Like it, it got mucked up somehow. It wasn't the cameraman's fault. Like something, it was like a faulty tape. And I remember calling, like I found out the name of the company that sold the tape. I called them. I was like, how do I fix this? And I don't remember how, but we dragged off like 
the, the most usable footage, we dragged it off the tape and we got it on the air and it was one of the best parts of the piece. And I just remember like producers saying to me, we have never seen anybody do that to get a story off a tape before. And I was like, we were not losing this story. So that's the one, that Detroit trip is one of the ones I remember because we mistreated Jimmy Howard's dad. Iserman treated those dads like gold and that tape almost got ruined. That's what I remember. Perfect way to wrap up uh, another edition of the Montana's Thought Line, Montana's Barbecue and Bar, Canada's home for barbecue. Wrap it up the podcast in a moment. Okay, Elliot, wrapping up the podcast here for another week. And don't look now, but 51-year-old Yaramir Yager is playing hockey again. We've talked about it before, why he's doing it. Uh, 51 years old, playing for Cladno, and got an assist in his first game. Yeah, so what that's going to do is it's going to restart the clock on his Hockey Hall of Fame, right? Three more years now until he's eligible to go in. And, you know, Chris Johnston had an article about it, and um, he's written about it before, um, about how the Hockey Hall of Fame is not going to change that. Like, they believe, nope, this is our rule, and we're not going to budge. I just want to say how much I really disagree with that. Um, and I'm not ripping Chris. I just disagree. I disagree <laughs> with the with the position. You know, the Hockey Hall of Fame is about are you a great hockey player, but it's also should be about do you represent the game well? Do you love the sport? Like, do you leave it in a better place than you found it? Like this, I like that thing Doug Armstrong said at the Blues media conference. Like, I haven't left the team better than I found it. I think about stuff like that all the time. And like, he is playing Yager because he wants to keep the team going. He is worried that if he retires and doesn't play, the team will not survive. And I don't think he should be penalized for that. The Penguins are retiring his number this year. I, like, I think he should be rewarded for that and not penalized for that. And I don't see anything wrong with carving out a one-time exception and saying, look, this is not going to be used as a precedent. It's just going to be in this particular case because it's unique. And I think he should be celebrated for what he's trying to do to keep hockey going in that small part of the hockey universe. And nobody's going to change my mind on this. Nobody's going to change my mind. I think he should be inducted right away. So it wouldn't be a one-time thing. This has happened where the mandatory... Well, with Lemieux and Gretzky, right? And and there's more. It's happened 10 times. It happened with Dick Clapper. It happened with Rocket Richard. It happened with Ted Lindsay, who, as a matter of fact, didn't attend his ceremony because at that point, wives weren't allowed to attend. And he said, if I can't bring my wife, I'm not going. And he didn't go. Red Kelly, it was way for Terry Sawchuk, who passed away in 1970. He was allowed in in 1971. Jean Beliveau, Gordy Howe, Bobby Orr retired in 1979. And guess what year he went to the Hockey Hall of Fame that same year, 1979. So this wouldn't be just a one-time carve-out. There's historical precedent for exactly what you're talking about here. So I don't, I don't see this as being somehow breaking with some great, unique tradition. It's happened 10 times before, Elliot. I can't believe you're actually agreeing with a take of mine. I, I agree with it. I think what he's doing is wonderful. And I'll tell you what, I like... The selfish part of me just hopes that he keeps on playing forever as long as he wants to and doesn't do it out of an obligation to try to save an organization and save a team. I just love the idea that there's this guy out there that still has the juice to play competitive professional hockey. And it's Yager, one of the best talents and one of the best personalities we've ever seen. I'm listening to you talking. I'm bobbleheading all of it, Elliot. 
Oh, well, you should do that and more all, often. All I want, no, no, this is seldom. This is this is a holiday treat. The only point that I wanted to add to what you're saying, because all I would do is just sort of amplify what you just said, maybe use, you know, more colorful and delightful language, because I went to Guelph and you went to Western, so my vocabulary is that much <laughs> more expanded. I just wanted to add to the fact that this wouldn't just be a one-off, or it's not just Wayne and just Mario. There's Clapper, there's Rocket, there's Lindsay, there's Kelly, Sawchuck, Bellavo, How and Orr. I put Yager in that. I put like all those names that I just named. You can put Yager in that conversation with all of those players. So I'm totally cool with it. Okay. I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah, I feel like I need a shower after agreeing with you. <laughs> I don't like that. So we'll wrap up the podcast on that. Uh, Hall of Fame, do the right thing. Yager goes in. Uh, okay, so on behalf of all of us here, we hope uh, the best for you and your family this holiday season. Health and happiness to all. You have Friday night games, you've got Saturday night games, and then the NHL goes dark for a few. We'll catch up soon right back here on 32 Thoughts, the podcast. All the best this holiday season to all of you and your families. 